Hey everybody, this is a important essay by Ricardo Bellofiori titled A Monetary Labor Theory of Value. It's a little old, not old, but it's from 1989. Um, this is a uh, one of the texts that I've been meaning to read from the uh, bibliography included in the book Marx Worldwide by Jan Hoff. Um, yeah, so that's where I uh, first heard of this uh, paper. And uh, I've read a lot of Ricardo Bellafiori in the past. Um, so uh, I should probably read some. Uh, I wanted to read some, some more of his work, and I think this is kind of like his like big essay or like one of his main contributions. So, um, I hope I'm pronouncing his last name right. This is the abstract at the before the essay starts. A critical survey of the recent literature on the labor theory of value is offered, focusing upon the view of Marxian labor theory of value as a macroeconomic theory of exploitation within the money circuit of capital. The traditional and the, quote, new solutions of the so-called transformation problem are rejected, and it is argued that the purely monetary reading of value and the revived classical Marxist approach have mirror-like weaknesses. The paper claims that Rubin's insight, that in the end value is created in exchange, but that the substance of value is latently present in production, can be pursued within a theory of money as a symbol. In this perspective, the concept of exploitation as the extraction of surplus value can be seen to be compatible with the concept of a non-commodity money. This reading of abstract labor theory of value, that the quantitative aspect of Marx's argument is relevant not for the setting of prices of production, but rather for shedding light on the actual process of incessant change in the economic structure. All right, so that's the abstract. Now it's time to read the actual thing, the real McCoy. Let's party. I've been criticized for moving too many objects while I read. Me shaking up my joe. All right, let's go. For real though. The aim of this article is to present a critical survey of the literature on the labor theory of value. Special emphasis will be given to a view of Marxian value theory, which maintains that it is both a macroeconomic theory of exploitation and distribution and a microeconomic theory of conflict within the labor process. This view has been developed in Italy since the late 1970s and is part of a more general approach in which Marx, Keynes, and Schumpeter are seen as forerunners of a perspective on the capitalist process, which sees it as a monetary circuit, starting with the financing of production by bank money. In the first section of the paper, I shall review some of the difficulties faced by the traditional version of the labor theory of value, which reduces Marx's abstract labor to the quantity of labor technically embodied in commodities. This interpretation sees the labor theory of value primarily as a theory of relative prices, and in my view it is effectively destroyed by the Srafa-based critique of Marx. In this section, I will briefly discuss this quote, excuse me, the quote, new, end quote, approach to the transformation problem, which has been recently advanced as a suggested solution to the contradictions of the traditional labor theory of value, and will argue that it is no solution at all. In the second section, 
I shall summarize some critiques of the neo-Ricardian approach made mainly in the 1960s and 70s. In the third section, sorry, one second. In the third section, I shall review the theoretical background of these critiques, namely the new reading of the labor theory of value, which stresses the social and monetary dimension of abstract labor. The latter is interpreted as produced in the act of exchange, where the private, concrete labors enter into a social relationship with each other. Value is the mark of a social validation, which occurs ex post, after the production processes. This reading, however, leads the more coherent of its proponents to defend only the qualitative side of the labor theory of value, denying any validity to its quantitative side. Thus, the labor theory of value is shown to be useless both as a theory of relative prices and as a theory of exploitation. In the fourth section, I shall mention some recent defenses of the quantitative side of Marxian value theory, which see it as a theory of price determination. These defenses argue that abstract labor is not created in exchange, but is produced as a, quote, real abstraction, end quote, within the labor, excuse me, within the production process. These positions have the merit of pointing out some real weaknesses in the monetary reading of Marx's value theory. However, I find them unable to rescue the latter from the charge of redundancy leveled against it by the neo-Ricardians. Thus, I shall try to save the quantitative side of the labor theory of value in Marxian theory via a different route and will argue that the alternative between either deduction of abstract labor from exchange as such, or from capitalist production, is a false one. This means that it is possible to affirm that value is created in exchange without collapsing into the position that on the only measure of abstract labor is in monetary units. However, I shall argue that Marx's values theory is flawed because of the contradictions of his commodity theory of money. It is because of these contradictions that the new monetary interpretations of value theory have endorsed a theory of sign money. Nevertheless, the view of money as the sole measure of value has been unable to offer a theory of exploitation as surplus labor. My contention in the fifth section will be that the integration of a qualified, quote, social reading of abstract labor into a monetary circuit theory of capital a la Keynes, Kolesky, Schumpeter makes possible a new definition of exploitation as surplus labor consistent with bank money. In the sixth section, I will make some suggestions as to how the monetary labor theory of value may also have relevance for the theory of relative prices and for the dynamic theory of competition. In the conclusion of the paper, I shall sum up the main argument of the paper and show that it was in fact foreshadowed in several respects by Schumpeter's reading of Marx in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy. Section 1. Value and Relative Prices in Traditional Marxism, Neo-Ricardianism and the, quote, new solution to the transformation problem. The debate over Marx's labor theory of value very early focused on the question of whether relative prices could be explained by a tr as a transformation of labor values and distribution of income between classes as a reallocation of labor expended in the workplace by labor power. Marx himself recognized that the exchange ratios between commodities could not be proportional to the ratios of the quantities of embodied labor if we presuppose free competition and thus the equality of the rate of profit between industries. 
So it was known from the start that the Marxian labor theory of value cannot determine in any straightforward way equilibrium relative prices. However, Marx suggested that his labor theory of value was able to determine them indirectly. Prices of production were given by the application of an average rate of profit. The average rate of profit was computed as the ratio of total surplus value over the sum of constant and variable capital advanced in the whole economy. Both calculated and labor embodied, this ratio was then applied to the value of the capital advanced in each industry, resulting in an estimation in prices of production of the output of each sector. In this way, Marx can speak of a logical priority of labor values over prices of production. To determine these prices, it is necessary to know the average rate of profit, and the latter is a, quote, value, end quote, rate of profit, i.e. a rate of profit seen as the relation between two quantities of labor. However, there was a flaw in Marx's argument. Though Marx was also aware of this flaw, which he thought could be removed, iterating his transformation procedure. The flaw was that in the transformation from values to prices of production, Marx applies his value rate of profit to capitals of the various industries still computed in value terms. This is inconsistent because it means that we are making a double valuation of the same commodity. When one commodity is seen as the outcome of a production process, we estimate it at its production price. When the same commodity appears as a means of production or as a wage good, we estimate it at its labor value. In 1885, introducing the second volume of Capital, Engels declared that in the third volume, Marx had solved the problem of the articulation between the labor theory of value and free competition with an average rate of profit. The following debate may be summarized in four steps. Glick and Erbar, 1987, excuse me, Glick and uh, Dollar, 1978, Glick and Erbart, 1987, Glick and Hunt, 1987. A first round was the attempt by Russian and German authors like Tugin Baranovsky, Dmitriev, Berkowitz, uh, uh, von Cherosov, to generalize Marx's solution in a system of simultaneous equations. They disaggregated the economic system into three sectors, means of production, wage goods, luxury goods. There was no longer a logical passage from values through the rate of profit to prices because the average rate of profit and the prices of production were now determined at the same time. Moreover, the average rate of profit which came out from the transformation was different from the, quote, value average of rate of profit. Also, the idea that capitalist circulation could only change the distribution of the value produced, not its amount, seemed to be shaken by the fact that in the generalized solution, it was no longer possible, except in special cases, to have the simultaneous realization of two equalities, between sum of values and sum of prices, and between sum of surplus values and sum of profits. A consequence was unclear, the relation, excuse me, a consequence was unclear, the relation between exploitation of workers and entrepreneurs' profit. However, the outcome of the first round of the debate seemed to be partially favorable to the theory because the prices of production were still calculated within an argument that expressed the methods of production and labor values. This was the point stressed by many in the second round of the debate, which may be dated from the first edition of Sweezy's theory of capitalist development. 
The contributors to this second round of the debate came mainly from the English-speaking world. The, references, the reference here is to the well-known contributions to the, quote, transformation, end quote, debate by Sweezy, 1942, Vinternitz, 1948, May, 1948, Daub, 1955, Meek, 1956, and Seton, 1956. This last author may be seen as straddling the second and third rounds of the debate. In the model which he wrote in his 1957 article in the Economic Journal, the economic system was seen as a disaggregated in N sectors, and in each one, inputs and outputs were measured in values. A year later, in 1960, Piroz Swafa published his masterpiece, Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities, where we find a very similar model, but where inputs and outputs are measured in physical unities other than labor. Thus, the publication of both models in a short span of time made clear that in the traditional interpretation of the Marxian labor theory of value, measurement by embodied labor was only a particular way to depict the conditions of production in the economy, a particular unit of account which could be replaced by any other. The third round of the debate is characterized by the increasingly general assertion that it is not necessary to start from labor values to determine prices of production, it is enough to know the productive configuration and the real wage, however measured. This conclusion is resisted by traditional Marxists like Sweezy, Dobb, and Meek, but it is clearly put forward by neo ricardians like Marco Lippi, 1977, Ian Steedman, 1977, and Pierre Angelo Carignani, 1981-1986 For these authors of the Marx the Mar me, for these authors the Marxian labor theory of value must be rejected because it fails in its aim of determining quote objectively the rate of profit and prices they argue that the Sraffian model is able to achieve this aim and provide a correct theory of prices while at the same time showing class conflict through the inverse relation between wages and profit. Neo-Ricardians are divided over the evaluation of the consequences of the rejection of Marx's labor theory of value. Some, like Greg Garignani, think that the change in the foundations of the theory will not affect the evidence, excuse me, the edifice and that the Sraffian theory of prices can revive all the other conclusions of Marx's capital, from the analysis of the labor process to the analysis of accumulation. Others, like Steedman or Lippi, think that the conclusion, excuse me, that the collapse of Marx's value theory opens up a difficult task of reconstruction in Marxian economic theory. Whatever the outcome of this discussion turns out to be, one thing seems clear. If Marx's labor theory of value is still defended, after Srafa, as a theory of relative prices which tries to explain these prices as a transformation of the quantity of labor, technically embodied in commodities, an answer must be given to the charge of redundancy leveled against it in the third round of the transformation debate. Many Marxists believe that this answer has been given either by the, quote, iterative transformation procedure endorsed by, endorsed by Anwar Sheikh, or by the, quote, new solution to the transformation problem independently proposed by authors like Duminil, Foley and Lipietz. Sheikh, uh, Amor Sheikh actually has a really great uh, series of lectures on YouTube that I highly recommend uh, anyone, uh, everyone check out. It's not just about Marx, it's just about like classical political economy in general, but it's very uh, enlightening. Um, 
Shake showed that it is possible to obtain the quote correct prices of production simply reiterating excuse me, excuse me simply iterating Marx's method to transform values into prices of production. In other words, Marx's prices of production are used as inputs. A new average rate of profit is calculated and new prices of production of the output are arrived at. The iteration goes on until the prices of production of inputs and outputs are the same. The prices of production eventually obtained by the iterative method are equal to the prices of production obtained by the simultaneous method equation. The reason for using a labor theory of value as a starting point in the determination of prices of production is, according to Sheikh, that values act as centers of gravity of the prices of production, which in turn are the centers of gravity of market prices. As in Bortkiewicz, I think that's how you actually found it. I said Borkovitz, Bortkiewicz earlier, but I think it's Bort. Kievich and Seton, however, the quote value rate of profit differs in general from the quote price rate of profit. The quote new solution, which we can call the fourth round of the debate, is a more radical critique of the traditional approach to the transformation problem. Its core can be seen in two assumptions. The first is what has been called the normalization assumption. That is, the assumption that the price of the net product is equal to the net product expressed in values, i.e. wages and profits are equal to the amount of living labor newly expended in the period. The second is what has been called the distribution assumption, which is the assumption that surplus value is defined as the difference between the value of the net product and the money wage. Following fully, we can define the value of money as the ratio between the total amount of labor expended in the year and the total money income. The value of the labor power will be the money wage multiplied by the value of money. In the aggregate, the value of the labor power is nothing but the share of wages and the value added. According to this view, the rate of surplus value is defined ex post in term of prices of production. In terms of prices of production. It is claimed that the achievement of the quote new solution is twofold that it is closer to Marx's own text and that the prices of production obtained from this procedure satisfy the double conditions posed by Marx himself for the derivation of prices from values. The line of, this line of thought is not totally convincing. Of the fidelity to Marx, it can be said that while it is certainly true that the new solution is more faithful to Marx's method in the third volume of Capital, it nevertheless breaks with it as regards one fundamental aspect we mentioned at the beginning of this section, i.e., the prior determination of the average rate of profit in value terms as the essential causal link between value and prices. On this topic, I believe the reconstruction of Marx's train of thought made by a neo ricardian like Fernando Vianello is on the right track when he writes, quote, Unlike Ricardo's, Marx's argument is explicitly framed in two stages. Since the prices of production differ from the values only on account of the different distribution of the overall surplus value of the economy, the rate of profits, according to Marx, is accurately determined. For the economy as a whole, on the basis of the labor theory of value. The prices of production are then obtained from the values by replacing the surplus value produced in each branch of production with the part of the overall surplus value of the economy belonging to that branch according to the general rate of profits, end quote. Vianello, 1987. 
This critical observation is the more relevant if one remembers that the, quote, new solution is compatible with the, quote, old one. The two solutions are, in fact, complementary. As Duminil himself has put it, quote, it is perfectly accurate to calculate prices of production on the basis of a mathematical description of a technique without even mentioning value, end quote. As regards the second point, the fact that in the, quote, new solution, the equalities between the sum of prices and the sum of values and between the sum of profits and the sum of surplus values are both preserved is due to the redefinition of the former in terms not of the total product but of the net product. I agree that this redefinition retains the essence of the labor theory of value, i.e., the fact that the net product is produced only by the abstract labor expended in the period. However, to quote Duminil again, once the quote new normalization assumption is made, the quote sum of profit equal to the sum of surplus value, end quote. Condition becomes a tautology, end quote. It is difficult to see how a statement which is true by definition can be argued to be a strength of a particular theory. Bearing in mind these critiques, a provisional conclusion can be drawn. Both the, quote, old and, quote, new transformations, quote, solutions have proved to be rather, quote, dis disillusions of the labor theory of value, or, to put it in a more charitable way, the transformation problem is still open. Section 2. A Marxian Critique of Neo-Ricardianism The traditional approach reads in Marx's value theory a theory of normal prices, seen as centers of gravity of market prices. The link between values and prices is important for two reasons. The first is that the theory of prices is seen as the core of economic analysis, so that a theory of the capitalist process must necessarily start from inquiry into exchange ratios. The second is the fact that prices are a transformation of values is thought to be the only, quote, demonstration, end quote, of the existence of exploitation in the capitalist mode of production because it permits us to subtract from the working hours expended by the labor power employed the labor hours embodied in the consumption goods which return to them as wages. A recent interpretation of Marx's labor theory of value reaches very different conclusions. This new unorthodox approach looks at Marx's labor theory of value primarily as a theory of money, a theory of endogenous in innovation, and a theory of dynamic competition. In reality, this current of thought is composed of many rivulets. In this and the next section, I shall underline only two themes and shall not discuss the internal differences between the various authors. The first theme is common to all the adherents to the new approach. This is the critique of Srafa and his followers, and it is based on the reading of value theory as a theory of the peculiar way in which society is constituted in capitalism and the consequent role of money. In this section, I shall address the critique of Srafa, and in the next section, I will discuss the new interpretive, excuse me, the new interpretation of value. The second theme is held only by some Marxists within this current and consists of a revival of the Marxian notion of, quote, socially necessary labor, end quote arguing its relevance for accumulation theory. Let me start with the critique of the Neo-Ricardian thesis, according to which production of commodities may be seen as the basis for the revival of classical Marxian political economy. Uh, production of commodities refers to the book, uh, Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities by Pierre Swafa. 
many writers, especially in the French-speaking world, Benetti, Cartelier, and de Brunhoff, among others, have stressed the fact that in the Sraffa model, as in Smith and Ricardo, labor and wage are one and the same thing. In other words, Sraffa goes back before Marx to a model in which there is no distinction between the use value and the exchange value of labor power. Of course, one may say that it is always possible to translate labor as a cost of production into labor as activity. If we look at the, that model expounded in production of commodities by means of commodities, where labor is expressed in terms of its means of subsistence, we can subtract the labor embodied in the means of subsistence from the labor embodied in the net output, interpreting the first as labor power cost of production, and the second of the, as the outcome of labor power activity. On the other hand, if we look at that other model contained in Sraffa's book, where labor is represented by the product of the employment coefficient of each sector for the average wage, we need only know the normal working day and the rate of exploitation to get necessary and surplus labor. But both suggested interpretations of Sraffa's theory are incorrect for the following reasons. First of all, the Sraffa model is depicted as if it were, quote, after the harvest, end quote. The productive configuration, inputs and outputs, is taken as given. So investigation into the determinants of the length and the intensity of the working day is ruled out from the beginning. Thus, there is no point in introducing the concept of exploitation because the latter is the outcome of a struggle within the labor process which has just ended at the moment in which Sraffa makes his photograph of the economic system. This, incidentally, is one reason why values are irrelevant in the calculation of the prices of production in the transformation procedure. In Marx's theory, there is a logical priority of the production process over the circulation process, i.e. of expected values produced over prices while in the, quote, old solutions to the transformation problem referred to in the first section of this paper, the analysis concerns only the circulation and the distribution of commodities. This point has been underlined, among others, by Lipietz in 1985. I don't know if I'm saying that right. It might be Lipietz or Lipietz. The second problem is that in the Sraffa model, more clearly than in traditional Marxism, when labor appears explicitly as the product of labor employed in each sector for the average profit, it must be interpreted as concrete labor. As Benetti, Cartelier, and de Brunhoff put it, quote, the allocation of abstract labor among branches of production can only be affected by the market. Thus, it cannot be considered as a technological given. However, Sraffa implies that it is just that. As a consequence, the quantity of the total annual labor expended in society is not abstract labor. Is it concrete labor? We then certainly have a technological given. But in this case, we cannot consider the quantities of labor employed in the different industries Quote, as fractions of the total annual labor of society, end quote, Sraffa. Thus, what appears, quote, explicitly, as labor in Sraffa, is in fact the product of quantities of concrete labor with a wage rate, end quote. Benetti, Cartelier, de Brunhoff, 1976, 34 to 35, my translation. In other words, there is no reason why the different concrete labors of the different industries should be considered homogeneous. They could be compared and added, as Sraffa does, only as the sum of wages paid in each industry. The factors of this mathematical product, the wage rate, and concrete labor quantities cannot be separated, which reveals how useless it is to speak of, quote, labor, 
in the Serafian framework. Accordingly, we cannot make a distinction in the working day between necessary labor and surplus labor. Following this line of criticism, it is possible to charge the Neo-Ricardians for committing in their equations, quote, the gross mistake of using the same symbol, L, to represent the quantity of abstract labor, end quote, and at the same time, quote, the quantity of manpower hired, end quote. The Pe Peets, 1985. The Peets wants to extend the Benetti Cartelier de Brunhoff argument and at the same time to show that its consequences are not so destructive by arguing that, quote, Datum L stands for the quantity of labor at an average intensity determining the representative production. Excuse me. A L. By definition, therefore, we are dealing with abstract labor. But what enters the production cost in the equation determining the price of production is the quantity of M manpower bought by the capitalist. The wage relation extracts the quantity L from M according to the ratios. I don't know what that symbol is. Maybe you do it like reverse, small reverse capital E. <laughs> Maybe that's not, no, it's not small capital E. It's not reverse. Why'd I say that? I.e. the labor intensity and fucking the weird symbol that looks like, no, oh, never mind. I'm not going to say what it looks like. You know what it looks like. I.e. the period of work fixed by the wage contract, which vary from one branch to another and from one year to another even when there is no technical change. This, corresponds, this correspondence may be expressed mathematically by a, quote, exploitation tensor, T, end quote. Lipietz, 1985. Or Lipietz. All right, I'm, I'm going to try to say Lipietz. Because I think that's right. This ingenious solution, however, is not convincing because it does not tackle the crucial point underscored by Benetti, Cartelier, and de Brunhoff, i.e., that, quote, the allocation of abstract labor among branches of production can only be affected by the market, end quote. Italics added. As I will now show, this statement should be understood as referring to two essential features of capitalism. The first is that the social system of reproduction is an outcome of the competitive process, and that accordingly the techniques actually in use cannot be taken as given before the analysis of that same process. The second is that abstract labor is actually created in exchange and thus cannot be seen as originating only within the production process. Lipit's rebuttal of Benetti, Cartelier, and de Brunhoff seems to underestimate the consequences of the first feature above for what he calls, quote, algebraic, end quote, Marxism, and to totally neglect the consequences of the second one. The two above critiques of the neo-Ricardian approach address the failure of Srafa's followers to distinguish labor and labor power, and thus point out that Srafians cannot maintain the Marxian idea that labor is the substance of value, and that surplus value is nothing but the external form of surplus labor. Some authors have advanced the argument that the labor theory of value cannot be rejected because these notions are essential for Marx's analysis of accumulation. 
According to this view, Marx's theory of innovation and of competition relies upon the notion of, quote, socially necessary labor, end quote, as the content of value, and upon the capitalist drive to expand surplus labor as the way to enlarge surplus value. Socially necessary labor was intended by Marx both as the, quote, technically socially necessary labor, the labor expended to produce a commodity following the average conditions within an industry, and as the, quote, economically, end quote, socially necessary labor, the labor which must be expended to satisfy social needs. If we examine the, quote, technical definition, we find that the, quote, socially necessary labor differs from the individual value, i.e. from the labor technically embodied in the commodity according to that commodity's particular production process. The, quote, socially necessary labor, end quote, is rather expressed by a social market value. Regulated by the labor expended according to the methods of production prevailing in the industry. However, once we introduce differences among producers into the economic picture, we move further away from the Srafian approach. In the neo Ricardian world, competition is seen only as the tendency to establish an average rate of profit between industries. In the Marxian view, it would be better to see it <laughs> as a dynamic process which expresses itself in the revolutions of methods of production put into effect by firms searching for extra profits within the industry. While the classics underlined only the former tendency toward an average rate of profit between industries, Marx emphasizes also the latter tendency toward a differentiation of profit within industries. This point has been underlined by authors as different as Sheik in 1980 and 1984, Zemler in 1984, Lipitz 1985, Aglietta 1979, and Salama 1975. In a similar vein, it has been argued that also the, quote, economical definition of socially necessary labor is foreign to Srafa's theory by Lingini in 1975. Indeed, in the neo-Ricardian approach, the prices of production are determined without any consideration of the total expenditure, while in Marx's definition, socially necessary labor is defined with reference to the latter. When effective demand deviates systematically from the level needed if market value must be regulated by the quote technical, excuse me, by the average quote technical end quote conditions of production, the market value itself changes being determined either by the worst conditions of production, if demand is persistently higher than supply, or by the best ones, if demand is persistently lower than supply. Section 3. Value and Socialization these critical observations on Srafa and his followers are developed by exponents of the new perspective using a notion of value which is very different from that of traditional Marxism. While traditional Marxists share with Neo-Ricardians an interpretation which stresses the continuity between Marx and Ricardo, abstract labor is interpreted as embodied labor, and Marx is seen as the, quote, last of the great political economists, The new view in value theory underscores the rupture between Marx and Ricardo. Abstract labor is portrayed as the opposite 
of private concrete useful labor, and Marx is seen as the founder of a critique of political economy. In the new approach, value is created in exchange. Where the indirect social link appears as the external connection between the labor of private and independent individuals, labor performed in the production process is seen as potential abstract labor, which will be validated on the market to become actual abstract labor. Thus, the key concepts of the new reading of Marx is, excuse me, thus the key concept of the new reading of Marx is the notion of value as the social validation of private labor in exchange. An important consequence of this view is that abstract labor cannot be reduced to embodied labor. Moreover, the fact that concrete labors are heterogeneous means that it is necessary to find an independent expression for the share of abstract labor performed in the individual production processes. For some authors in the new approach, this expression is given by the concrete labor embodied in commodity money because the latter is the only labor which is immediately social. Thus, abstract labor and money are two faces of the same coin. From this point of view, it is possible to criticize classical and neoclassical theories, because both develop the theory of value before the theory of money. The stimulus of the new theoretical perspective on value, which springs from this revival of the Marxian critique of political economy, cannot be denied. At the same time, it seems inconsistent on many grounds. I want to stress here only two major points, the first concerning money, the second concerning the rate of exploitation. In the new approach, money, though produced like a commodity, cannot be seen as one commodity among others. A commodity is produced by a labor which is social only in an indirect way. Through the exchange with money, on the other hand, the labor producing money is immediately social and does not need to be validated on the market. Thus, some authors have concluded that money has no value because the notion of value is linked to the validation of private labor in exchange. From this point of view, it is easy to shift to the idea that money is an institutional representation of abstract labor, i.e., it is essentially a symbol, though sometimes a use value can be its support. However, it is possible to arrive at the same conclusion from another more radical route. If money is a commodity, it means that it is the outcome of a production process. For Marx, any production process must be financed by the advancing of money capital. Thus, the question arises where the money commodity comes from which is necessary to start the production of the money commodity. The problem can be solved only if the financing of production is explained by the advance of credit money by banks, and the latter seen as sign money newly created ad hoc. If money has no value and is not produced by labor, there are difficulties in the definition of exploitation. Exploitation is the difference between the value created by labor power, i.e. the labor performed by labor power, and the value of labor power, i.e. the labor embodied in labor power. According to Marx, wages are advanced in a monetary form at the beginning of the capitalist circuit, and they are expended at the end of the circuit by the consumption goods. In other words, the real equivalent of money wages is known only at the end of the circuit. 
Thus, the value of labor power at the beginning of the capitalist process is known only if, in the exchange between money capital and labor power, we already know the value of money capital. But I have just stressed that credit money has no value of its own, so that labor power cannot take its value from credit money at the beginning of the circuit. The consequence seems to be that it is impossible to calculate the amount of surplus labor in production. Since before exchange, we do not know the value of labor power to subtract from the value created. In recent years, many of the proponents of the abstract labor approach to Marxian theory, faced by the difficulties outlined in this section, have decided to maintain only the qualitative aspect of the labor theory of value, or to abandon altogether any reference to the latter, preferring to develop a totally monetary interpretation of capitalism and to abandon talk of exploitation and production. They have been criticized for shifting the process of abstract labor from the sphere... Excuse me. They have been criticized for shifting the process of abstraction of labor from the sphere of production to the act of exchange. I shall review and comment on this critique in the next section. One second. Sorry, sorry. Okay, section four abstract labor, exchange, and production. The most cogent arguments against the deduction of abstract labor from exchange have been advanced by David Gleicher. According to Gleicher, the new interpretation can be defined as a, quote, Rubin school, because all its adherents argue, like the Russian economists, that labor becomes abstract in the exchange between commodity and money. From this statement, Gleicher thus maintains that for his approach, money is the sole measure of abstract labor, that labor time cannot be measured independently from monetary exchange, and that the labor theory of value is not a theory of price determination. Gleicher, in contrast, believes that abstract labor arise as, arises as a, quote, real abstraction, end quote, within the labor process. It is the result of the simplification of collective labor which reduces the skill required. Makes individual workers more mobile and divorces their subjective activity from the production of use values. Thus, the quantities of labor time are measurable before exchange. This quote, quantitative, end quote, side of the labor theory of value helps to explain, quote, the central theoretical problems posed by the capitalist mode of production, the determination of the structure of prices of production, end quote. I shall contend that each proposition in this sequence is debatable, but that nevertheless Gleicher's critique cannot be easily dismissed, not because of the strength of Gleicher's approach, but rather because of the difficulties of the monetary perspective on value theory. Rubin did not collapse abstract labor time and money magnitudes. Rubin did derive abstract labor from exchange, but did not deny that in a qualified sense, the substance of value was already determined in the production process. 
Moreover, I think it can be demonstrated that within the Rubin approach, the reference to labor as a, quote, imminent measure, end quote, does not only express a qualitative aspect of value, but also a well-defined quantitative aspect, which is the basis not for price determination, but for structural change. The first point I want to tackle is the grounding of abstract labor within exchange as such or capitalist production. In my opinion, Claudio Napoleone has decisively shown that the two positions can both be seen as endorsed by Marx and that the ambiguity between the two presentations of the abstract labor concept in Marx's writings is only apparent. It is worth noting, excuse me, it is worth quoting Napoleone at length here. When abstract labor is seen as the result of exchange, quote, the labor of the individual is not immediately social. The labor of the individual is private and independent. Then the task of constituting society rests entirely on labor as an object or product. Labor though not immediately social, becomes social in and so far as it is productive of money. Since, however, in the light of this assumption, all products are equal because they are general wealth through money, all types of labor, in so far as they produce money, are also made equal and parts of a general communal labor. Hence, individual labor, that is, concrete, useful, and determinate labor, becomes social inasmuch as it is turned into its opposite, abstract labor, end quote. Napoleone, 1975. On the other hand, quote, capital is circulating money in a permanent or conserved form since in this case money can serve as a means of acquiring new money. Only when this permanence of money occurs, and the, quote, use value of a product appears merely as a support of exchange value, end quote, does wealth fully assume the character of abstract wealth and the labor which produces it the character of abstract labor, dot, dot, dot. The thesis is that the abstract character of labor is matched by the abstract character of capital. Labor is abstract insofar as labor is wage labor, end quote. Napoleone, 1975. There is no contradiction here between the two definitions. Quote, One must bear in mind the Marxian thesis that exchange only becomes general and hence capable of forming a society with the, the, present, with the presence of capital. Production is mercantile in a general rather than sporadic or marginal sense, only when production is capitalistic, dot, dot, dot. This means that, according to Marx, the derivation of abstract labor from the exchange mechanism rather than from capital is a false exercise. In reality, exchange without capital is inconceivable. One can equally well say that abstract labor is that which produces exchange value under unique social, that is, capitalistic conditions, as that abstract labor is wage labor in opposition to capital, and that because of such opposition, abstract labor's only product is exchange value. End quote. Napoleone. The interpretation according to which abstract labor as the living labor of the wage worker and abstract labor as the dead labor objectified in a product are, quote, basically similar things in the one case looked at as activity, in the other as a result, end quote, Napoleone, 1974, 
can be traced back to Rubin's essays on Marx's theory of value. With his, quote, sociological and, quote, abstract labor theory of value, Rubin made the decisive break with the way in which traditional Marxism takes for granted the social nature of the labor expended in the processes of production and evades the question of the heterogeneous nature of concrete labors, i.e., by its reference to a physiological concept of equal labor. In the reply to his critics, Rubin further developed his argument along lines which overcome the difficulties of what has been wrongly called the, quote, Rubin school. According to Rubin and Marx's value theory, abstract labor must already exist in the process of production, and yet at the same time be created in exchange. However, exchange is not here intended as a particular phase of the capitalist process, but rather as its social form. Quote, as soon as exchange really became the dominant form of the production process, exchange also stamped its mark on the phase of direct production, end quote. I think you can think of, I think it's probably helpful, I don't know if he's going to say this, but it's probably helpful to think of the way that um, exchange uh, and competition uh, via exchange comes to uh, dominate the labor process. It might be useful to think of that in reference to the way um, Marx discusses uh, cap, uh, the labor process being subsumed to capital in different phases, in different ways that are kind of uh, in both formally and really with um, the formal uh, when capital comes to appropriate pre-existing labor processes and real uh, when uh, capital reorganizes uh, labor processes uh, to satisfy its own imperatives, its own requirements. Um, I wonder if he's going to say that uh, the way that um, the abstraction, I don't know, real abstraction comes to subsume, the real abstraction uh, <laughs> that takes place at exchange comes to uh, color and subordinate the labor process. I wonder if he's going to say that. He's already said that in, indirectly, but I wonder if he'll make the he'll use the words subsumption at all. When labor is included in the process of production of a particular capital, it is still concrete private labor. But it is also potential abstract labor. Private labor in the process of becoming abstract social labor. Thus, wage labor activity, even before the mediation of the market, is labor tentatively producing for the market. Quote, where Marx refers to exchange as a separate phase counterposed to the phase of production, he says that labor and the product of labor possess a determined social character even before the process of exchange but that this character must yet be realized in the process of exchange. In the process of direct production, labor is not yet abstract labor in the full sense of the word, but has still to become abstract labor, end quote. Rubin. It is possible to expand these observations into a more explicit analysis of the relationship between abstract labor and money. It is certainly true that abstract labor eventually comes into existence with the exchange of commodities, with money. Nevertheless, the fact that the activity of wage workers is potential abstract labor before exchange as such allows us to speak of a quantitative aspect measurable in labor units before exchange. 
Therefore, it is possible to speak of a potential rate of exploitation, which captures the extraction of surplus labor within production. Furthermore, the fact that labor is abstracted in the act of exchange is no less a, quote, real abstraction, end quote, than Gleicher's abstract labor, as Lucio Coletti, another interpreted of, interpreter of Marx's thought who took up Rubin's line of thought, pointed out long ago. Quote, the process whereby, quote, abstract labor is obtained far from being a mere mental abstraction of the investigators is one which takes place daily in the reality of exchange itself, end quote. Lastly, as the quotations from Napoleone have shown, the deduction of abstract labor from exchange is compatible with the thesis that it is a phenomenon which is historically specific to capitalism. All these conclusions can be drawn remaining within the Rubin approach and without retreating to the classical Marxist labor theory of value endorsed by Gleicher. Nevertheless, Gleicher's critique cannot be totally jettisoned in this way. Gleicher is right in that the major part of the unorthodox approach has abandoned any labor theory of value, while at the same time adhering to a monetary theory of exchange. This outcome, as I mentioned in the last section, was precipitated by the contradictions in the commodity theory of money. Thus, Gleicher's critique could be overcome only if Rubin's achievements, vis-a-vis -vis the monetary abstract labor theory of value, are proved to be compatible with a non-commodity money capitalist system. Another major weakness of Napoleone's and Rubin's argument alluded to by Gleicher in his critique of the Rubin school, is that while in their deduction of abstract labor from exchange, the starting point of the analysis appears to be, as in Marx, the commodity is such, when they argue that the contradiction between the derivation of abstract labor from exchange rather than from capitalist production is non-existent, they appear to take money capital as their starting point, e.g., quote, The thesis is therefore that labor does not systematically produce money except insofar as it is a commodity, labor force, and acquired by money and so governed by it, end quote. Napoleone, 1975. Section 5. Credit, Money, and Exploitation. My aim in this section is to show that there is a way out of the contradictions of Rubin's reading of Marx's labor theory of value, which still maintains a quantitative analysis of exploitation as surplus labor, but also endorses a theory of sign money. However, one can go down this path only if one radically changes one's view of the labor theory of value and adopts a perspective different to both traditional Marxism and unorthodox Marxism. I refer here to the recent interpretations which maintain that Marxian labor theory of value must be reread as a macroeconomic monetary circuit theory of exploitation 
and thus implicitly stress that value theory should start not with the analysis of the commodities as such, but rather with money capital. To this end, I find it useful to integrate into the Marxian analysis of the capitalist circuit the insights provided by Keynes' Treatise on Money, by Koleski's writings of the 1930s, and by Schumpeter's theory of, ma of, eco me, theory of economic evolution. Let me start with a description of the monetary circuit in capitalism. The capitalist process may be seen as a production of abstract wealth, which starts with money and ends with money. Entrepreneurs start the circuit, thanks to the bank financing of production. By buying a certain amount of labor power on the labor market at a given money wage. This is the only advance of money capital they need. If we assume we are in a closed economy, which is composed of only three macro subjects, banks, firms, workers, entrepreneurs decide how to allocate the labor power employed between two sectors, the first which produces means of production and the second which produces consumption goods. At the end of the production period, the consumption goods are sold on the market against the monetary wage bill. If we suppose for the sake of simplicity that the worker's propensity to consume is, to consume is equal to one, and the capitalist's propensity to consume is zero, all the consumption goods go to workers and all the wage bill advanced by entrepreneurs returns to them. Thus, at the end of the period, entrepreneurs can repay part of their debt to banks. In fact, they can pay back to them only the capital advance, but not the interest. However, workers have also produced for entrepreneurs the means of production. The latter are not sold on the market, but are redistributed among firms at the end of the circuit. Thus, the means of production produced by workers become private property of the entrepreneurs, a form of the abstract wealth which is the outcome of the capitalist process. They represent the surplus labor, which will become capital in the next circuit when these new means of production will be used to newly exploit workers. Part of this surplus can be sold to banks to pay the interest on their finance. Interest can also be paid in another way. If part of the output of the consumption goods sector is not sold to workers on the market, is, quote, not available, end quote, to them, sue me, is, quote, not available to them, to borrow Keynes' phrase. Sorry, there's some weird punctuation errors, I think, here. This fraction can be devolved to banks. Our problem can now be restated in the following terms. We know that the credit money, which starts the capitalist circuit, is newly created ad hoc as bank money. As a consequence, we also know that we cannot determine the value of labor power before production thanks to a predetermined value of credit money. So it would not seem possible to speak of exploitation in production. My suggested solution is to introduce into this picture workers' expectations regarding the subsistence wage. If we assume that what workers aim at when con contracting their money wages in the labor market is a target real, quote, substance, end quote, wage, excuse me, is a target real, quote, subsistence, end quote, wage, sorry about that, we can calculate an expected value for this consumption bundle. The value of the subsistence wage is only, quote, expected, for two reasons. The first is that in this model, it is possible that entrepreneurs may not respect workers' expectations as to their target real wage. In other words, the amount and composition of the consumption goods that are produced and sold on the market against the money wage bill 
advance to workers are autonomously decided by entrepreneurs and can diverge from workers' expectations. It must be stressed that the notion of entrepreneurs, quote, autonomous, end quote, decisions is here intended mainly to refer their freedom in the choices affecting the sphere of production. Following Graziani, the capitalist process is seen as a world in which, quote, firms enjoy a total independence for decisions concerning the real sector. Wage earners, on the other hand, can only decide how to spend their money wages, end quote, Graziani. This point was very clearly made by Keynes and Kaleski in the early 1930s, but also by Srafa in his trenchant reply to Hayek in their discussion of, quote, forced saving, end quote, imposed upon workers. The second reason is that we know that value is created only in exchange, so that we must wait until the end of the period before seeing the social validation of the private labor expended in the production of consumption goods. In other words, the values produced in all the production processes within the period are only expected values until the commodities are sold on the market. This point has some similarity to the notion of expectations in Keynes' general theory. Like Keynes, we can suppose for the moment that entrepreneurs' short-term expectations are realized within the period, so that the expected value is equal to the produced value. With the help of these notions, it is possible to define exploitation in production at the end of the labor process, and before commodities are sold on the market, exploitation is given by the difference between the labor expended by labor power, i.e. the, quote, expected value of the product, and the labor embodied in the expected real wage, the, quote, expected value of the labor power. Thus, at this point in the capitalist circuit, exploitation in production is calculated on the basis of quantities which have yet to be validated in exchange. Following Rubin, we may speak of a potential or latent rate of exploitation and is not necessarily equal to the actual rate of exploitation. The latter is given only after the determination of the actual real wage, the basket of the consumption goods actually consumed by workers, which is the outcome of entrepreneurs' decisions, and after the actual realization on the market of the values potentially created in the production process. However, the rate of exploitation can be higher than the potential rate of exploitation if there is forced savings at the expense of workers. Following Keynes's approach in the Treatise on Money, we can examine this situation in two steps. Let us assume that after a period when investment and voluntary savings equal each other, a positive gap emerges. As the outcome of different autonomous decisions of the entrepreneurs expressed by a reduction in the consumption goods supplied to the market, other things being equal. There will then be an excess of the sum of money wages over the lower quantity of consumption goods valued at the, quote, old, end quote, price. Finally, there will be inflation in the consumption price level, and this will reduce workers' real consumption. The example shows a rise in the rate of exploitation not due to changes in the production process, but rather to the power of the capitalist class to decide the allocation of labor, and as a consequence, the structure of the output. The actual rate of exploitation can also be lower than the potential rate according to the measure in which 
there are losses of value on the market due to a fall in demand relative to supply, so that part of the expected values are not confirmed in exchange. The amount of abstract labor eventually created in a given year is then equal to the effective demand. The value of the product is greater than the amount of money advanced by banks at the beginning of the circuit, i.e. the wage bill. This conclusion is due to the fact that in the aggregate the surplus product is gained by the firm's sector as if it were, quote, in kind, end quote. There is no need for the surplus to be exchanged with money proper, which is only used for transactions between macro subjects, banks, industries, workers, and not within them. However, if the surplus product must be, quote, realized in money, a new inflow of liquidity directly from banks or through a government budget deficit needs to be granted. That was the kernel of truth in Rosa Luxemburg's accumulation of capital. The relationship between this, this analysis of exploitation and the traditional one can be easily expressed as follows. The old concept is a special case of the new one, the case in which workers' expectations about their consumption and entrepreneurs' expectations about exploitation in production and about the selling of their products on the market are all realized. Under these assumptions, the expected value of labor power is equal to the actual value of labor power. And the expected value potentially produced within the labor process is also equal to the value actually created in exchange. If these conditions do not hold, the rate of exploitation will partly ex depend on determinants other than exploitation inside the labor process. In other words, our theoretical apparatus permits us to analyze the effects on exploitation of the decisions of the entrepreneurial class on the level and composition of output and of the changes in effective demand. One thing should be pointed out, however. There is an important asymmetry between workers' and entrepreneurs' expectations. If the workers' expectations are not realized, there are feedback effects on the system through the reactions of entrepreneurs. On the other hand, nothing need happen if workers' expectations are not fulfilled. For savings and a higher rate of exploitation at the expense of workers do not necessarily give rise to disequilibrium. Whereas the presence of unsold commodities open up a crisis in the system. <laughs> in this approach, workers do not have market instruments to defend their real consumption. They can only affect their economic position through class struggle in production or through political action. Contrary to the traditional view, exploitation is here represented is not a consequence of the private property of the means of production. It is rather the other way around. It is the monetary nature of the economy, as captured by the distinction between banking and industrial capital and the exclusion of workers from the financing of production, which, quote, explains, end quote, exploitation, and thus the private property of the means of production. In other words, it is the banking, excuse me, it is the bank financing of production, which gives entrepreneurs social power over workers. It is the preferential access of firms to credit money, which gives the entrepreneurs power over the workers' time. This power finds its expression in entrepreneurs' decisions over the allocation of the employed and in their struggle to secure and increase labor time and surplus labor. I said that weird. 
As a consequence, the struggle against exploitation is not a fight over the juridical regime of property, but rather over the control of the use value of labor power, and more generally of the production process. The macroeconomic character of this suggested approach does not mean that it has no consequence for the explanation of the microeconomic agent's behavior in the economy. It does mean, however, that this argument is independent of the theory of, quote, normal, end quote, prices, which one wishes to adopt. In fact, in the suggested approach, we can divide the total working time in the economy into two parts. On one side, we have the necessary labor which comes back to workers as consumption goods. On the other side, we have the surplus labor time. The abstract wealth which takes the form of the surplus which accrues to firms and banks. Different price rules can change the distribution of the surplus inside and outside firms, but not the amount of consumption goods which are sold to workers in real terms this is given before exchange. If we assume that entrepreneurs' expectations regarding the dynamics of exploitation in production and of effective demand are fulfilled, price rules do not affect the way total labor time is shared between the capitalist class and the workers. If, however, some of these expectations are not fulfilled, there will be a change both in prices relative to expected normal prices, and in values, relative to expected values. Thus, the quantitative aspect of the abstract labor theory of value, defended here, does not find its fundamental expression, as in Gleicher's argument, in the theory of production prices. Further considerations on this topic are, however, set forth in the next section. Section 6. Finance, Prices, and Distribution. The argument put forward in Section 5 allows me to make a comparison with some recent trends in value theory, i.e. fully circuit theory of capital and the new developments in prices of production theory. Duncan Foley has developed in his writings a model which resembles the one I have expounded in the text. However, though in his model money is seen as credit money, the latter is not intended as bank money. The word, quote, bank, never appears either in the index of Foley or Foley, in, excuse me, it, the index of Foley, 1986, or Foley, 1986, B. Foley's money capital is only money-denominated financial, excuse me, Foley's money capital is any money-denominated financial asset. The bargaining on the credit market is between capitalist firms. And, quote, the existence of banks and other financial intermediaries does not change this picture significantly, end quote. Foley, 1986b. It has been rightly noted that, quote, he ignores the ability of the banking system to create credit independent of deposits, and its inability to force capitalists to borrow if they don't want to, end quote. <laughs> end quote. Weishart, 1988. We may add that in Foley's discussion, there is an element of exogeneity in the money supply relative to the currency issued by the state. And in his model household's holdings of money, excuse me, that in his model, households' holdings of money contribute to the market of funds, and that, as a consequence, investment appears dependent upon savings, 
because the level of the rate of interest is partially determined by households' deposits. Thus, Foley can conclude that, quote, Marx's theory of the interest rate is in the tradition of the loanable funds theories, end quote, and can introduce finance as a necessary factor only to bridge the realization gap in expanded reproduction. In my model, in contrast, the essential monetary nature of the circuit of capital is clearly linked to the prior distinction between the bank capital sector and the industrial capital sector. Production needs an advanced provision of finance, which is wholly supplied by banks and must be discretionally renewed and or enlarged period after period. It follows that in a pure credit money capitalist system, i.e. ignoring the government sector and central bank supplying legal tender, the process of creation and destruction of bank money is totally endogenous because capitalist production must be financed in every period, independent of accumulation and crisis. The rate of interest is a conventional magnitude fixed by banks, and the amount of investment does not depend in any way on savings, but on credit supply and entrepreneurial demand. Things do not change if we introduce a central bank. Once it is realized that credit creation has no intrinsic limit, because of credit rationing and the elasticity of the credit supply, Due to the pro-cyclical shifts in the free reserve requirement ratios of the banks. Likewise, the currency issued by the bank is here intended only as credit money, lent out to the government by the banking system, either by the central bank or by private agents whose money was earlier created by banks. This view of the money creation process differs only from the loanable fund theories, excuse me, differs not only from the loanable fund theories, but also from the traditional interpretation of Keynes liquidity preference, and can rather be seen as a revival of Keynes finance motive, stressing the fact that quote, finance once granted must be renewed again and again, end quote. Graziani, 1984. The reader is warned, moreover, that in Foley's argument, the, quote, value of money, end quote, may depend on variations in the money supply, which is not completely endogenous. Thus, his theory seems at least partially compatible with the quantity theory of money. In my argument, in contrast, the value of bank money is equal to the value of labor power, which is the only commodity acquired by entrepreneurs at the beginning of the circuit. It may be useful to show in what limited sense the new approach shares some common ground with the quote new end quote solution to the transformation problem. I have defined the rate of exploitation as the difference between the value of the net product assumed to be equal to the price of the value added, and the value of the real wage, i.e., the abstract labor, quote, embodied, end quote, in the given basket of wage goods, divided by the latter. Thus, the rate of exploitation differs from the ratio between the surplus value and the wage expressed in price terms i.e. differs from the profit-slash-wage ratio. We seem to be left with two divergent rates of exploitation. This is not an odd result, but rather a strength of the new approach. It is certainly true that workers are consumers, excuse me, that workers as consumers must buy the wage goods. Their, quote, subsistence, real wage at the prices fixed in the sphere of circulation, according to the general rule of a uniform rate of profit. 
the prices of production, fixing profits and money wages, redistribute among individual firms the total amount of live labor extracted from labor power. Accordingly, for entrepreneurs, what appears as the crucial magnitude is what we may call the, quote, price, rate of exploitation, which is the rate of exploitation arrived at by the, quote, new transformation procedure. But things are very different if we look at the capitalist process from the point of view of production, i.e., from the point of view of workers as laborers and of capital as a whole. Here the crucial matter is how much live labor is performed and how much of the live labor expended by workers must be devoted to the production of the necessary wage goods. Thus, the relevant measure of exploitation is now the, quote, value rate of exploitation, unaffected by price determination. The latter is, so to speak, the thermometer of the relative strength of social classes within the labor process, and is the main factor determining the, quote, price and, quote, rate of exploitation. In the new approach defended here, the determination of prices of production is seen as dependent upon the changes in the productive configuration induced by innovation. Innovations are generated within the labor process as the outcome of the class struggle between entrepreneurs and workers over hours worked and the increase in surplus labor. Thus, the labor theory of value explains the process by which the data in the computation of production prices are determined. A similar view has been put forward by Anwar Sheikh as a vindication of Marxian theory where, according to this author, prices of production are seen as, quote, shifting, centers of gravity of market prices. They are, quote, shifting because of the cyclical waves of innovations within the production process and are, quote, dominated by variations in the value magnitudes. Shake manifests, excuse me, Shake maintains that in this way, competition is depicted as a double cyclical movement toward disequilibrium inside the industry and toward equilibrium between industries. Therefore, the labor theory of value, quote, explains what neo-Ricardians take as given, i.e. the data of the, quote, transformation, and presents a richer analysis of competition as an essential feature of capitalist reality. However, this line of argument is unconvincing. Not only do the gravitation models which have been proposed up to now have well-known problems, but above all they ignore the fact that the notion of dynamic competition maintained in Marxian theory is linked to the view of endogenous innovation as an incessant and continuous process. For Marx, dynamic competition competition between firms, struggling against each other to gain surplus profits, is an expression of the capitalist drive to control and increase the labor extracted from labor power. Thus, there are theoretical reasons to expect an autonomous investment process, which will go on as long as a social market value is established in the industry allowing entrepreneurs to calculate costs and receipts of innovations. But there is no reason to expect that the upsurge in innovation will happen at the same time in the whole economy. If this perspective is correct, as I wish to argue, there is an alternation of equilibrium and disequilibrium only, quote, locally 
in each branch of production. And while there is always disequilibrium in the whole economy, if equilibrium is defined according to the equal rate of return rule, from this point of view, prices of production appear more as an ideal point of reference than centers of gravity. It is certainly too soon to fully see the political consequences of the suggested reading of the labor theory of value. Nonetheless, I think that a brief but useful comparison can be made between this approach, the Neo-Ricardian, and the Post-Keynesian. All these schools may be said to stress conflict as against harmony and capitalism, but they are very different in the nature of the conflict which they see at the core of the struggle between classes and fractions of classes. According to the Neo-Ricardians, conflict is mainly at the distributional level. Workers can raise their share of the output through struggles over money wages, struggles capable of eventually raising real wages. If entrepreneurs reply with inflation, this is only a political reaction, without any objective basis. The Srophian system shows that the only effect of high, higher wages will be a reduction in the, quote, equilibrium, end quote, rate of profits. So workers should try to index their wages and to defend the real improvements gained by the struggle over money wages. No clear limit is set to this struggle by the rate of profit linked to the growth rate of the economy. If we suppose that there are unemployed capacities, the post-Keynesian vision is the opposite. Once the growth rate of capital is given, so is the rate of profit. As a consequence, there is only one level of wages which is consistent with that growth rate in a Srophian model of the determination of, quote, normal, end quote, prices. The suggested approach is nearer to the post-Keynesian than to the neo-Ricardian one. There are three major social conflicts highlighted by the monetary circuit view of the economy. Between entrepreneurs and banking capital, over the price and conditions of the financing of production, among different firms within industries, what has been called dynamic competition, between entrepreneurs and workers, the main object of the conflict being the use value of the labor power. As I have said above, it is possible to infer from the suggested approach, as from the post-Keynesian, but not from the neo-Ricardian, that struggles over money wages are incapable of raising the real wage. In the model, Described, a higher wage bill against the same basket of consumption goods will only raise prices, and indexation will only create ever-increasing inflation. However, in the suggested approach, workers can change their destiny if their struggle is able to gain ground before the market, in the labor process, or after the market, in the social and political arena. The Economic Theory of the Future Marxian value theory has been reconstructed in this paper both as a monetary theory and as an abstract labor theory of value, showing how abstract labor and money are necessarily connected but not identical concepts. This position may be traced back to Rubin but was revived in Italy in the early 70s by Claudio Napoleoni and Lucio Coletti. It has, however, encountered serious difficulties which have been well brought out by the, quote, value form analysis, end quote, approach, and by the, quote, French school of Benetti, Cartelier, and De Roy. 
The argument proposed here is that the monetary labor theory of value can be rescued if it is reframed in the money circuit theory of capital, developed in Italy since the late 70s by Graziani and others. In this way, it is not only possible to, quote, save the quantitative side of the abstract labor theory of value, keeping both a macroeconomic notion of exploitation as surplus labor, and at the same time a non-commodity, sign money, it is also possible to see the abstract labor theory of value as a specific theory of economic evolution. It is striking how this reading of Marx was anticipated by Schumpeter, and how it has been ignored by traditional Marxists and Neo-Ricardians alike. In fact, Marx's theory is outlined here is a, quote, monetary analysis, end quote, in the Schumpeterian sense, i.e. a theory which, in, which, quote, introduces the element of money on the very ground floor of our analytic structure and abandons the idea that all essential features of economic life can be represented by a barter economy model, end quote. This Marxian monetary theory does not do away with a, quote, real, end quote, analysis of production, but rather integrates it into a monetary view of the capitalist process as a whole. Schumpeter was trapped in the traditional view which saw Marxian value theory as an equilibrium theory, and he did not realize that his positive judgment of Marx's theory as a theory of economic development was in fact a praise for Marxian abstract labor theory of value, and that this theory could be made compatible with the monetary circuit theory of capital, which he also endorsed. Indeed, the best summary of the Marx presented in this paper are Schumpeter's words in Capitalism, Socialism, and Democracy, quote, we need only look at Marx's analytic aim in order to realize that he need not have accepted battle on the ground on which it is e so easy to beat him, bracket, i.e., the value theory, excuse me, i.e., value theory as a theory of equilibrium relative prices, Ricardo Bellofiori, end bracket. This is so easy as long as we see in the theory of surplus value nothing but a proposition about stationary economic processes in perfect equilibrium. Since what he aimed at analyzing was not a state of equilibrium, which, according to him, capitalist society can never attain, but on the contrary, a process of incessant change in the economic structure, Criticism along the above lines is not completely decisive, end quote. And again, quote, all that is faulty or even unscientific in his analysis runs a fundamental idea that is neither the idea of a theory, not merely of an indefinite number of disjointed individual patterns or of the logic of economic quantities in general but of the actual sequence of these patterns as of the economic process as it goes on, under its own steam, in historic time, producing at every instant that state which will of itself determine the next one. Thus the author of so many misconceptions was also the first to visualize what even at the present time is still the economic theory of the future, for which we are slowly and laboriously accumulating stone and mortar, statistical facts and functional equations, end quote. Schumpeter, 1942. Thanks for listening.